Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Carney. I'm the Director of Media Relations here at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, welcome to the historic National Academy of Sciences building here on the uh, National Mall in Washington, D.C. We are pleased that you are here this morning um, for this public briefing to release a new report from the academies titled Gene Drives on the Horizon, Advancing Science, Navigating Uncertainty, and Aligning Research with Public Values. Um, following uh, opening presentations from our co-chairs, uh, we will open the floor to uh, questions and answers, including to all of those of you uh, watching online on the web who can submit a question uh, via webcast. We also hope that you're following the conversation on Twitter at uh, hashtag gene drive study. Uh, the briefing will last about an hour or until we have no further, no further questions. Uh, and when asking a question, please identify yourself and your organization if you're representing one uh, here today, uh, please, including if you're submitting a question via email. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our committee panelists uh, here today, starting with uh, our co-chair uh, in the middle, James Collins, who is the Virginia M. Ullman Professor of Natural History and the Environment in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. Uh, to his left is committee co-chair Elizabeth Heitman, who is Associate Professor of Medical Ethics at the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. To her, to her left is Jason Delborn, who is an Associate Professor of Science, Policy, and Society in the Program in Genetic Engineering and Society in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resource Resources at North Carolina State University. Uh, on the far right is Lisa Tannehill, an Associate Professor in the Department of Animal and Avian Sciences at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, tee up our opening presentation, which will be done by Dr. Collins and Dr. Heitman uh, taking turns, starting with Dr. Collins. All right, uh, good morning everyone here at the, uh, at the Academy in Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon or good evening is appropriate depending where else you are in the world at this particular time. It's a pleasure to be with you here today to uh, help, you, help us walk through some of the major findings from uh, this report on uh, gene drives on the horizon. Uh, as was already mentioned, I'll do part one. I'll get us through sort of the first 12 or 13 images, and then uh, my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Heitman, will take us through the rest of the uh, report. This is a consensus report as far as the Academy is concerned, so it was prepared by this uh, distinguished group of individuals we can see on this slide here. The four of us are representing uh, our colleagues who helped prepare uh, this, uh, this document. It has been uh, quite an effort. Uh, we're at the end of about a 10-month process. It has been intense, but uh, fulfilling in many, many ways. And for our colleagues who are, who are listening, uh, we are, uh, we're going to lay this out as well as we can and represent you and all of the great ideas that we've had and discussed over the past year. Here are the names of the individuals that were involved in this process. Uh, the members of uh, this committee, 15 of us. The key point to take away from this image here is the idea that we have individuals with a wide variety of uh, interests and expertise as far as scholarship is concerned. You see individuals in biosafety and biosecurity, individuals in basic biology in general, plant biology and ecology, science and technology and the law. The point of this slide is that these are individuals of very, very diverse interests deliberately chosen to provide a mix of people in the natural sciences and social sciences because we felt that the issues 
that would be raised as far as this area of scholarship is concerned warranted that kind of a strong, important discussion between individuals in these two great areas of research. And it should be noted that the chair and co-chair, uh, co -chair, the two co-chairs of the committee represent the natural sciences and the social sciences as well. So this is a, a key point that I want to make right from the beginning. When we think about the process as far as these academy reports are concerned, here you have an image of the uh, web page from uh, the committee's uh, process. You can see, and what I want to call attention to here, is the idea that the peer review literature was consulted widely. Uh, no surprise there. We, support, we sought and included expert input through a variety of public workshops, workshops and a webinar series. So you see listed, you can find listed on our home page, 11 webinars. 38 individuals contributed to uh, helping us think through the current state of science, the current state of the natural sciences and social sciences as far as this particular area of work is concerned. We had a day-long workshop and we also sought and included public uh, input. So it was a lengthy process and one that individuals can take advantage of now. These webinars are all posted and it's part of the enduring record as far as the work of this committee is concerned. And these webinars were just excellent. Uh, individuals put a significant amount of work into them and were really very, very helpful as far as uh, we were concerned in helping us understand what was going on in terms of uh, gene drives, uh, their research and application. So let's think for a moment about why this study and why now? What are the motivations for the study? You can see in this image here, five, that uh, there has been a significant uptick in the amount of research connected with uh, gene drives as we go from the 1960s up through 2015. So one message, though, to make clear is that as far as basic research is concerned, we've known about gene drives for uh, a good deal of time certainly throughout the 20th century, as a basic biological process, this has been, uh, been known. But it was starting in the 1960s that proposals were first brought forward to harness that basic biology as far as gene drives is concerned, which I'll get to defining here in just a second, and tie it together with the possibility of manipulating the genome using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So we have a long bit of history as far as gene drives are concerned as a basic biological process tied to a new technology, an emerging technology in the form of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And it's worth pointing out that that CRISPR-Cas9 technology itself emerges from a deep understanding of basic biological processes once again in microbes. So we have two great areas of basic biology that are pulled together around a technology to make advances in terms of application in what we now call gene drives research. Basic research married to applied research, giving rise to applied research. It's an important take home lesson as far as this particular report is concerned. So the CRISPR-Cas9 technology was first used for genome editing in 2012. And by 2015, we have proof of concept in the laboratory demonstrations as far as gene drives are concerned in yeast and fruit flies and in two species of mosquitoes. This science, as indicated in the slide, is moving very, very rapidly. One reason as far as the motivation for the study is concerned. Another reason emerges from what we're hearing in the uh, technical literature as well as in the media. Here in image six, you can see several suggestions for, in particular, as far as how gene drives might be used, or might be applied. Could be applied in public health for controlling uh, vectors of infectious diseases, could be applied in conservation to control invasive species, could be implied in, applied in agriculture in a variety of different ways, and, and absolutely it can be applied in terms of basic research. We can use this technology to understand better than we do now basic processes as far as ecology, evolutionary biology, 
genetics, molecular biology in general is concerned. And so these are four big areas in which individuals in the technical literature or in the media are discussing how these things could be used and as part of the motivation for this study. Finally, in the course of this conversation, we've seen a variety of questions that have come up. And these questions include, could these gene drives have unintended consequences? And we'll have some things to say about that in just a minute or two. Do we know enough to consider releasing gene drive modified organisms? Should, even should, a gene drive be used to suppress or eliminate a pest species? And how do we decide? How do we make these decisions? Are they local decisions? Are they more global decisions? How does this happen? And we'll say some things about that in the context of governance. So what is it that's causing this uh, big attention to the whole notion of gene drives? What are gene drives? As illustrated here in image eight, gene drives are systems of biased inheritance in which the ability of a genetic element to pass from a parent organism to its offspring through sexual reproduction is enhanced. That's the technical definition. That's what's going on as far as the basic biology is concerned. So in terms of the image that you see on the screen uh, here in Washington or elsewhere, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see classic what's called Mendelian inheritance, in which we see a trait passed from parents to offspring. And as you get even into the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, you see the frequency of those genes remaining the same. In a gene drive inheritance system, you see starting out with, as illustrated here, a mouse that's colored purple or really deep blue. As you go from one generation to the next, by the time you get to the third generation, you see all the individuals in the population are purple. All of them are bearing the trait that was driven through the population. So a gene drive is a process. A genetic change is able to spread through a population. It's a process by which you can drive a genetic change through a population. You spread a trait through a population by altering the expected rules of inheritance. So by way of an example, let's imagine a species in which there are two sexes, males and females. And as you go from one generation to the next, the ratio of males to females is expected on average to be about 50-50, half males, half females. In a gene drive modified system, you begin to alter the frequency from 50-50 to, let's say, 60% males, 40% females. 70% males, 30% females. And an extreme in one experiment, 99% to 1%. 99% to 1%. It means then you have a technology to alter the representation of a particular genetic trait in a population and move it to a point where nearly all individuals in that population hold that trait. In principle, that's what could happen. Now, if it goes that far, stick with me here for a minute, and you're in a species with two sexes, and we move it to all males, the consequence is clear. The consequence could be the extinction of that population, certainly the reduction in numbers of individuals in that population, or even the extinction of a species in an extreme. It is, therefore, a powerful technology. It's a powerful technology representing the combination of these two features of basic biology in order to move these genes through a population. So here are more basic facts as far as gene drives are concerned. They occur in a number of species in nature. So there are natural gene drive processes that happen in nature, and they work through various kinds of mechanisms. But the earliest proposals to use them, to apply them, in terms of perhaps altering the number of individuals in a species that could be uh, having negative effects as far as humans are concerned, date to about the middle of the 20th century. The idea of spreading these gene, using these gene drives to spread particular traits through populations. Other kinds of um, facts and potential uses for gene drives include the fact that you use a gene drive to drive a trait through a population, so you want spread and you want persistence. You want that trait to persist in a population. 
There's also the possibility for causing irreversible ecological change, something we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. So the potential uses here include, at a very high level, population suppression. You can control the number of individuals within a population. And in the course of doing that, you could take the numbers down very, very low and get to population replacement in terms of changing the genetic characteristics of that population so that in principle, in theory, all individuals in a population could hold a particular genetic trait that you wanted to push into that population. As you think about the biology of gene drives, however, you want to keep clear in your head the fact that there are criteria for choosing a species in which you could develop a gene drive. And in particular, here are four. It's a sexually reproducing species. You want a species that has a relatively short generation time. Think in terms of days or weeks or months. You're not thinking in terms of years, probably. You're not thinking in terms of elephants. You're not thinking in terms of human beings in terms of gene drives. The generation time is just too long in those species, the last two, elephants and human being, to have a significant effect as far as pushing a trait through a population is concerned. From the molecular biology point of view, you want the molecular elements that you're using to be stable in order to drive the, the gene through the population. And they want the population to be structured in a particular way that facilitates the movement of the gene drive. You don't want it to be widely separated geographically, at least if that's the case, that individuals are not moving very easily across that, genetic, across that geographic landscape. Gene drives will not work well in all kinds of organisms. Now, as the committee began to do its work, and we thought about the science surrounding gene drives, it became clear to us very, very quickly that the use of this technology involved thinking very deeply about responsible science in terms of developing gene drive technologies. So you see in this diagram here on image 12, responsible science is at the center of how we were thinking about things and arrayed around the idea of responsible science are the six major areas that are discussed in detail in the report and that we're going to open up for you here now over the next 10 minutes or so. Responsible science calls for a cautious evaluation and assessment of the social, environmental, regulatory, and ethical considerations of gene drives, the so-called so LC implications, ethical, legal, and social implications of this uh, research. And we'll talk about each of these elements as we go forward from here. And the other thing that became very clear right at the very beginning was the importance of values. We argue in this report that values need to be a key element of the discussion from conceiving of the research to developing the research to applying the research. Values need to be recognized and applied Values, of course, are deeply held, complicated, and sometimes evolving beliefs about what kinds of things in humans and the wider world we are valuing. We uh, should pay attention to in terms of how we regard them and why we regard them as significant. And this conversation has to be part of what's going on as far as the science and the development and application of the science is concerned. And you're going to see that played out in a variety of ways in the report. So we see this as a key feature, the idea that values are part of the discussion. Now, my last thought before I turn the podium over to my colleague has to do with the state of the science. So here's a key conclusion as far as the report is concerned. There is insufficient evidence available at this time to support the release of gene drive modified organisms into the environment. First thought, insufficient evidence right now. Second, there are, however, clear potential benefits of gene drives for basic and applied research. And these are significant and justify proceeding with laboratory research and highly controlled field trials. Highly controlled field trials meaning that in the course of moving from the laboratory to the possibility of a release without containment, without confinement, there are steps along the way in which moving out of the laboratory involves moving into 
caged situations and moves, moving into uh, glass houses of some sort, situations that allow you to control the biology as far as the organisms are concerned before they're released completely out into the environment. We also recognize that there are gaps in our knowledge, particularly with regard to the ecological and evolutionary implications for organisms, for ecosystems, for communities. We need to understand these things better, and we need to understand better the risk associated with these various sorts of releases and how to engage the public. Our recommendation then at this point would be that funders of gene drive research need to coordinate and collaborate if feasible in order to reduce the gaps of these knowledge, this, these knowledge gaps. And this is something that we emphasized considerably in our visit yesterday with members, representatives of various agencies as well as um, individuals up on the Hill. So with that, what I want to do in terms of phase testing is turn the next part of the presentation over to my colleague, Liz Heitman, and she'll walk us through the rest of it. Thank you. Good morning. For much of the rest of uh, our discussion, we are going to be basing our commentary on a, a graphic that is here on this slide. It's also on page 81 of the full report with a hypothetical case study uh, on page 85 of the full report. Our challenge was to think about and come up with recommendations for how to develop the knowledge to fill the gaps and to think about what evidence we need to be able to make decisions about whether, when, and how to move forward with any kind of additional release into the environment. What do we need to know, and how do we get to that knowledge in a safe and controlled way? Gene drives are intended to persist and spread, and as a result, the kinds of knowledge that we need to have result from uh, our lack of understanding about the target organisms as they would manifest a gene drive. We need to know more about the role of specific organisms that might be candidates for gene drive research in the environment. We need to know more about potential for unintended consequences, such as off-target within the organism or non-target external to the organism effects. We need very definitely to know more and to develop better containment and confinement strategies to minimize unintended release, unintended persistence in the environment of any kind of gene drive modified traits. And we need better systems for monitoring, both to detect and long-term monitoring uh, of gene drive, gene drive modified organisms that are uh, used in any way in, in the environment. This is all research that needs to be tested in a very careful stepwise way. The phase testing pathway here is one that we have uh, based on the World Health Organization's pathway for testing of genetically modified mosquitoes. It is intended to be a simultaneous assessment and testing with a constant feedback loop of not just the science, but also questions of public engagement and public values, thinking about regulation and other forms of governments, governance. How do we understand what controls need to be in place, what best practices are? This is all part of the planning, starting with phase zero before even the laboratory work is done. At each stage, answering the questions of what evidence do we need to move ahead? Do we have it? What is its quality? What are the uncertainties? What are the unknowns? How do we answer them? What are the harms and benefits that we can envision? What are the neutral effects that we're going to have to monitor? At each step, these questions will need to be answered before moving to the next step. One of the important considerations in the phase testing is the safety at each stage. And throughout the report, we talk about the need for confinement and containment, both in the laboratory and in any external to the laboratory testing. Confinement, as we use the term, and it's used widely in a lot of contexts, slightly differently uh, in different fields, confinement is the use of ecological conditions 
such as climactic isolation or biological methods to prevent unintended or uncontrolled persistence of an organism in the environment. Whereas containment is the use of human-made, often uh, restrictive environments, as Jim mentioned, or natural physical restrictions, such as geographic isolation, to prevent unintended or con uncontrolled release, or what we might call in lay language escape, of an organism into the environment. So large cages or greenhouses or aquaculture pens and geographic isolation, such as on an island. So our recommendations in this area are that wherever possible, researchers should include a gene drive that spreads a visible marker to distinguish modified organisms and facilitate research and monitoring, knowing what you're looking at and knowing whether you have a wild type or a modified type to begin to monitor. And in thinking about mitigation strategies, there's been a lot of discussion in the literature recently about reversal drives where a, a system would be built into the organism to um, be effectively an off switch or a reversal switch. We are, would recommend that researchers, regulators, and other decision makers should not rely exclusively on a gene reversal drive as the sole strategy for mitigating the effects of another gene drive, but rather should have a number of other mitigation strategies, both traditional and perhaps new. When we think about field testing sites, this was one of our specific uh, tasks to address, how to understand criteria for selecting sites for field tests. We s identified four key criteria. The first would be clearly the scientific and technical considerations, the presence of the target species or the absence of the target species if we are looking to see how uh, how safety considerations might uh, occur in the environment, and clear methods of containment and confinement. It is essential to have recognition and inclusion of the values of the relevant publics, particularly the communities that may be in the environment where, where the release may occur. Do they want? Do they not want? Do they understand? What do they understand? How do they envision their lives both before and after? the gene drive modified organism might be introduced? What is the problem that they wish to see resolved? The capabilities of local, regional, and national governance structures are also going to be important for oversight of any kind of study in that regard. And then the ability of researchers, researchers from, often from the, the uh, upper income countries where the science is being conducted in laboratories, to be able to engage with local communities and speak in a way that understands and incorporates local community values. So our recommendation in this regard is that in site selection, preference should be given to locations in countries with the existing scientific capacity and governance frameworks to conduct and oversee the safe investigation of gene drives and development of gene drive modified organisms. By scientific capacity here, and I hope we can discuss this a bit more in the question and answers, we don't mean simply the laboratory expertise. We mean other kinds of understanding of ecological and field knowledge, how the systems in those particular environments work in relation both to humans and themselves. One of the big considerations that comes up in any introduction of a new technology is the question of the risks that it involves and how to identify and anticipate particular outcomes of gene drive research was an issue that we addressed in some detail. The, the word risk is often used in lay language to imply threat, and we want to clarify that as we use the word risk, we use it more as risk assessors do to Im imply a kind of probability, a likelihood of particular outcomes that could be benefits, they could be harms, or they could be neutral. So in this context, our definition of risk on the technical level is the probability of an effect, an effect that is caused by uh, one or more specific stressors on a specific endpoint or endpoints. And one of the key elements that is a little bit uh, complicated in the situation of gene drive research is we are looking at multiple stressors and multiple endpoints. This requires something that we don't have a slide for, but that is an important component of our report, 
complex mathematical modeling using either Bayesian statistics or Monte Carlo methods to be able to predict outcomes with multiple variables. So what we're talking about in terms of risk in more common lay language is how we can recognize the likelihood of a specific change or changes in the environment, how those changes will affect something that we consider to be of value, either human health, perhaps outdoor recreation, or the protection or survival of an endangered species. How do we think about the likelihood of changes and their effect on outcomes for those individual uh, concepts of value. The field that we turn to in the report for thinking most about risk is ecological risk assessment. This is a new term for many people and it uses phrases that are common in other fields and other areas that do not do what ecological risk assessment does with the same comprehensive scope. Right now there are methodologies available, particularly through ecological risk assessment, to look at risk, to look at the probability of certain outcomes using the methodologies of ecological risk assessment. The advantages to ecological risk assessment are that they move beyond the notion of harm and evaluating the harm that might affect, harm that might be an effect of a particular intervention. Ecological risk assessment quantifies the probability of outcomes with mathematical modeling by also identifying cause and effect pathways, not simply an association. It uses mathematical models to identify sources of uncertainty. And it demands the incorporation of public values and public engagement as part of the assessment of both harms and benefits that might be addressed. In this regard, it's also possible then to compare alternative strategies and to inform research and public policy decisions. At present, there are no guidelines that speak specifically to gene drives, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But relevant U.S. guidelines and technical documents are not yet sufficient on their own to guide ecological risk assessment for gene drive technology. This is a gap that we did identify. We've spoken several times now about public engagement and the fact that public engagement is needed in research, in risk assessment, and in governance. And it is a very important conclusion of our report that public engagement in gene drive research and any potential for its application cannot be an afterthought. It must be an integral part of the process of development and prior to research itself. The outcomes of engagement, in fact, may be as important as the scientific outcomes in thinking about decisions on whether to release a gene drive modified organism into the environment. One of our important conclusions thus is that governing authorities, including research institutions, funders and regulators, should develop and maintain clear policies and mechanisms for how public engagement will factor into research, ecological risk assessments, and public policies about gene drives. And we recommend that more work be done on how to engage publics in different situations and for different kinds of questions. There are a number of challenges to governance, which was the final component of, of our task, how to think about the adequacy of governance as it stands currently. And we want to make it clear that governance does not simply mean regulation. The governance of research begins with the personal responsibility of the investigator. Responsible science requires responsible scientists. And gene drive research has actually been marked by an amazing engagement of the scientists themselves in discussion about ethics, in discussion about values, in discussion about very forward thinking uh, assessment of the possibilities of the technology. The personal responsibility of investigators is often formalized in professional guidelines, either from institutions or from professional societies and then often extends to legally binding policies and enforceable regulations at the governance level, at the government level. But we concluded that existing mechanisms of governance may be inadequate to address potential immediate and long-term environmental and public health consequences because they don't consider gene drives intentional spread. They don't consider gene drives potential irreversible effect on ecosystems. 
often they lack clarity in the jurisdiction of their oversight and who it is that is responsible for which components of oversight. Most of them provide no structure for public engagement, and those that do have insufficient structures for public engagement, and they don't address the potential for misuse. Lack of policies for collaborating with other countries with divergent systems is another gap that we speak about in a few moments, but that will be a very important component of the governance of gene drive research. So our recommendation in this regard is that the U.S. government clarify the assignment of regulatory responsibilities, and I'm ahead of myself by one slide, I apologize. The diversity of potential gene drive modified organisms and contexts where they may be used reveals a number of overlaps in U.S. regulation, as I mentioned a moment ago. And we see this in a couple of our case studies, particularly with mice, mice on islands that may, uh, may be attacking and, in fact, in some contexts are threatening the survival of shorebirds that are already endangered, mice as agricultural pests. How do we think about a gene drive in a mouse? Is a gene drive inserted into a mouse considered a new animal drug? that would be governed by the FDA? Is it a rodenticide that would be governed by the EPA? Or is it a plant pest that would go be governed by the USDA? The rules are not clear. And then beyond that, there are a number of US agencies that may have interest and a stake in the regulation that don't have a place in the US coordinated framework, such as the US Fish and Wildlife Service, again, if we're thinking about shorebirds, the Bureau of Land Management or the National Park Service if that's the jurisdiction where the, the research is going to be carried out. So the recommendation that I wanted to make a minute ago, the U.S. government should clarify the assignment of regulatory responsibilities for field releases of gene-derived modified organisms, including the relevant roles, the roles of relevant agencies that are not currently included in the coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology. And then finally, the challenge of international work. Regulation of genetically modified organisms under the U.S. Coordinated Framework and the U.N. Convention on Biological Diversity, which includes the Cartagena and Nagoya Protocols, is predicated on the idea of containment, which we discussed a moment ago. However, containment is the wrong model, because after release, a gene drive modified organism is intended to spread. Multinational approaches to governance are also going to be necessary because a gene drive modified organism does not know and does not respect political boundaries and the spread will go across jurisdictions. So our final recommendation for today's briefing is that research institutions, regulators and funders should revisit international regulatory frameworks and national laws, non-governmental policy and professional codes of conduct on research to determine whether and how they may be applied to specific contexts of gene drive research and to be able to work together for what will be international collaboration in this regard. We'd like very much to thank our staff members, Dr. Keegan Sawyer and Dr. Audrey Tevenant, who are here in the front row, as well as the director of the Board on Life Sciences, Dr. Franz Sharples. We had uh, wonderful support from Angela Colvinesco, who is in the back, and we were indebted to our many speakers, 38 speakers who spent time with us on 11 separate webinars, and members of the public who spent time communicating with us by email and by letter. We had dedicated report reviewers who spent an awful lot of time giving us detailed feedback. And our committee members could not have been more collaborative. We had uh, an enormously good time working on things that for many of us were um, quite challenging to get our hands on uh, in a nine-month period. We're grateful, of course, to the sponsors, the National Institutes of Health and the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, as well as the National Academy of Sciences, Biology and Biotechnology Fund. It, it is important to recognize that the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation contributed to, uh, the, national, uh, to the Foundation for National Institutes of Health and National Institutes of Health funding, and we're grateful to them. And with that, I'd like to call our members of the panel up, and we'll take questions and commentary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if our committee panelists could uh, 
take their chairs and uh, we'll open it to uh, questions. Uh, if you're here in the room, we have a couple standing microphones. If you could go to one of those microphones, please. Uh, and if you're watching online, you can submit a question via email. As I said at the uh, start, uh, please identify yourself and your organization. Uh, as we're waiting for, uh, for the emails to come in and for folks to uh, hopefully queue up at the microphones, uh, let me uh, start the conversation um, by asking, uh, you note that it's too early for, for gene drive modified organisms to be released into the environment, uh, yet you also call for this phased testing approach that would include field, uh, highly controlled field studies. Could you, um, as a committee, uh, elaborate on the distinction between a field trial test and a release into the environment? Is there a way to, is there a way to draw the line there? If you'd like to add anything to that, and then we have some questions. Sure. So, so what we have in mind in terms of our thinking there is that this uh, process of research should occur in steps, phases, in which the work is done within uh, clear-cut laboratory environments, situations in which the investigator has a high level of control as far as the biological material is concerned. And then you would move from there in that kind of laboratory environment to something that would be out of doors, something in the field. But you'd be doing it in a caged environment. It could be screened cages. It could be some sort of a greenhouse, a glasshouse a facility, another kind of situation in which you have a high level of control over the biological uh, material. The field trial could also occur in an area that gives you uh, great geographic control. If you're working on an, uh, an island that's, uh, that's isolated in terms of it being an oceanic island, let's see, as let's say, uh, removed from a continental situation, and there's control over the movement of organisms on and off that island, then again, you have another level of control as far as release of the organisms is concerned uh, prior to doing the sorts of releases that would be envisioned in a more continental situation. Okay, uh, we'll start over here, yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Todd Keegan from the Woodrow Wilson Center. And first, I want to congratulate you on the Herculean task you were given and the report you produced. Um, I want to build on, on the field trial question and to see if you guys explored whether there's an infrastructure problem that we have in terms of where you would actually start doing some of these field trials and whether the U.S. needs to invest in actual places where you can do these kind of large-scale ecosystem manipulation studies and whether if you saw any evidence um, that the agencies that are funding gene drive research, be that the NIH, DARPA, or NSF, are actually making investments um, to begin to get you to the ability to actually understand the gap that I think you made in that first uh, recommendation between gene drives and our understanding of, of the ecosystem impacts. That's a very important question. Thank you very much. Uh, we maybe could emphasize more than we did at the beginning the fact that we recognize that there's been huge breakthroughs, developments in the molecular biology, but so far out ahead of the ecological research that it one of the reasons that it is not ready to move forward is that there are many things about the ecological research we simply haven't studied. And to put into context what is happening in the lab into the environment, uh, we don't have not only infrastructure gaps, but we don't have the knowledge about how the infrastructure gaps might be filled. What needs to be done, what, what systems need to be in place is an area where we, we would recommend uh, more attention be paid. Whose responsibility that is, one of the recommendations we made is that the people who typically fund this kind of research need to coordinate better and ideally collaborate to be able to think about moving from one area to the next. Uh, Todd, uh, thanks for your question. There's, there's another, other kinds of ways to think about uh, an answer and that we go something along the lines that there's, of course, a, a pretty rich history of um, research in, uh, in ecology, uh, research in the agricultural sciences that have involved in one way or another uh, going from laboratory environments to field experiments of one sort or another or field trials of one sort or another. So there is that literature 
that's available in both um, uh, basic research as well as application. So it provides a framework, a structure to begin to think about how you would go forward. So one of the important messages from the, from the report is that there are ways to think about moving ahead with this research and investments will be needed because the level of containment that we're calling for in terms of working with these sorts of gene drive modified organisms would be greater than the levels of containment typically associated with an average experiment in ecology in which you're testing a basic theory or in agriculture in which you're looking to um, develop a particular kind of application. So it's sort of the level of stepping up to uh, control uh, the organisms and the possibility of uh, inadvertent uh, release from the uh, controlled situation. That's where we have to be thinking. And the degree to which agencies need to think about even larger investments, uh, we didn't go into in particular, but uh, it's clear that it's just sitting right there. It sort of begs the question that uh, what sort of larger facilities might be appropriate as this work is scaled up, as these techniques are developed, and there's more interest in having areas in which uh, the modifications can be tried before released into the environment. Lisa? I'd just like to add, too, that I think another um, gap that we noted um, with respect to funding and, and such is in the um, area of ecological risk assessment. So having some resources devoted to that to help us really model what would happen mathematically um, under conditions of multiple stressors and multiple endpoints that are desirable will be really critical to have that information as we move forward through the phase testing approach. Okay, hi, I have a question from the web. What role do you see international public health NGOs playing in gene drive control techniques for malaria? I think we're all going to have something to say about this question, but one of the important components is that governance comes in multiple forms. And before there is regulatory oversight of this research, there's going to need to be researchers developing best practices. And the NGOs that do work in a wide array uh, of areas, both with malaria and other infectious diseases that are particularly concerned about control of vectors, have the possibility of setting standards for the research that they will fund by determining what kinds of safety and oversight is present in the projects that they uh, are willing to support. The notion that there are international standards for good laboratory practice, there are international standards for uh, informed consent doesn't necessarily give us international standards for public engagement. And NGOs can, in fact, begin to set international standards or local standards if they're working in a a single international area, so outside the United States, to begin to work on what it means to do public engagement in a responsible way. I'll add, too, that um, our report emphasizes the importance of public engagement, stakeholder engagement, and community engagement. And that's not simply to acquire the approval of a community to go forward with gene drive uh, research, but it's also to learn uh, from communities and stakeholders, and so it may be a, it may be that international NGOs have a role to play in providing information to the scientific community about best practices in particular uh, environments, as well as as being um, a connection to local communities and their knowledge and their preferences as well. Go ahead. I was I was just going to add that one of the. Um, things that the report recommends is this idea of, of an open access online repository of um, gene drive protocols, um, whether it refers to good laboratory practices, standard operating procedures. And we think that uh, the committee recommends this because it will be really useful to have when we're thinking about these international issues if we have something that, that is available um, for people that are doing this research. Uh, another kind of message for NGOs and, and even more generally is that the committee worked very, very hard in all features of this issue 
to provide the sort of context that would be need, needed in order to move forward with research, in order to think about the conditions under which you might want to apply uh, this sort of technology. So one would hope that those who are thinking about um, how this might be applied in situations related, for example, to uh, infectious diseases, would take the time to step back, see what the context is, the larger context, how help can be drawn to decision-making processes, and be able to use this report for guidance in a variety of different ways. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm David Schultz. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg BNA News. Uh, right now, I, I believe there's a, I think it's a British company that uh, uh, is looking to do a field trial of mosquitoes that have been uh, uh, have had a gene drive, uh, and they've uh, applied for uh, a permit with the FDA, I believe, in to do a field trial in the Florida Keys. Uh, I guess that would be one of the uh, measures to uh, respond to to Zika, and I believe the FDA has given a preliminary approval to that uh, the conduction of the field trial. I've, um, would do you or are you aware uh, of? this uh, potential field trial and would you support it given, uh, I guess, what the, the you put in the report? So we we weren't asked to comment. It was outside of our task as far as specific specific cases are concerned in terms of in terms of the application. Uh, in, in that instance, we would want to know whether or not you have a gene drive involved or you're using other sorts of technologies in order to modify those mosquitoes as far as the Oxitec situation is concerned. So that would be the first set of questions. And it's not a gene drive modified organism. It's just a genetically modified mosquito. And so. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between that? I'm going to turn that over to my biology colleague. <laughs> OK. So um, the gene drive, as we've defined it, is this um, genetic element that has the ability to be passed on at an enhanced frequency. So here you're looking at a trait that's going to be passed on from the parent organism to its offspring at a, in biology speak, greater than Mendelian frequency, so greater than 50 percent. Um, a genetically modified organism doesn't have that um, ability. It's not being um, prefer preferentially passed on from one generation to the next. Okay. Well, maybe I'll I'll follow up with you after afterward because sure. I'm a little still a little confused about the difference there. And and this is an important confusion that there is in fact a very wide array of genetically modified options that are being pursued by many people in many species that are not gene drives. And the distinction is an important one that perhaps we can talk about in a bit. But um, one of the things that our report stresses is that a gene drive may not be necessary to do many of the things that people would like to do with genetic modification that is already on its way to being better regulated. Yeah, th this is a, to put a, a really fine point on, the, on this, it is important to understand what the genetic technology is that's, that's being proposed in any particular set of circumstances. Question one in the phase testing approach is is a gene drive approach needed or are there other sorts of technologies that are available um, that have a pretty good history now in terms of use it's understood how they how they work and so if it's not necessary to go in this direction don't go in this direction thanks one other thing that i'll add is that when you also think about gene drives you need to th think about two features the ability for them to spread and persist and that's going to be different than a genetically modified organism. Thanks. Yes, sir. I'm J.D. Hansen uh, with the International Center for Technology Assessment. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-authors of the uh, statement called Principles for the Oversight of, of Synthetic Biology, which I would, for the sake of argument, include gene drives um, in. Uh, I commend your uh, underscoring the need for, for public and community involvement. Uh, I would urge you to, uh, to also expand it to uh, workers, including uh, lab worker involvement. We've already had cases of, of some pretty bad infections. Uh, uh, caused by genetically engineered viruses, 
but uh, we need to continue to pay attention to uh, all the different kinds of, uh, of publics and the unions uh, as well as uh, local people should be included in this. Um, and, and then, um, you know, I also commend your recommendation of, of looking at uh, ecological risk assessments and would urge the next iteration to, um, uh, to emphasize comparing ev even more uh, alternatives for example, with, uh, with uh, dinghy, uh, we used to hear about how genetically engineered mosquitoes were gonna, gonna solve it, and we quit hearing about it when Sanofi uh, developed a vaccine. So it would be good if, if as we compare things, we compare all of, the, all of the options, and the way the federal government does it right now is pretty crazy. We have a, a, an infected, a mosquito infected with Wolbachia to uh, a bacteria to control its spread is regulated by the EPA. A mosquito genetically engineered is regulated as a new animal drug by the uh, FDA. A moth genetically engineered with the same construct is regulated as a plant pest by the um, uh, APHIS, and, and so, you know, part of the ability to do the good ecological assessments is to have teams of people in the government that understand enough about these animals and understand enough about the diseases to be able to do it. Right now, we, we're just scattering it around the government. Thank you. The, I think the, one of the things that we stress that we did not mention in the, uh, the slide set is the fact that we call for strong educational practices, particularly in academic institutions, to talk about preparing for gene drive research. The notion of responsible science education is not simply an online course. It's something that must be started with the PI and laboratories and go through ongoing self-education. One of the things that we saw that was um, sort of breathtaking in our committee work is that we had a, a team of 16 people, all of whom had to learn enormous quantities of new information in order for us to be able to work together on the report. This is an enormous quantity, uh, you said Herculean task, um, an enormous quantity of new information that people need to think about. and. It is something where ongoing education is important within the scientific community. And then the public engagement piece, I would suggest that the laboratory workers are, are the front line that need to have a good understanding of best practices and why. Jason, do you? Just th that your point about the different regulatory oversight mechanisms for similar animals underscores our point that um, there are gaps and overlaps in the regulatory system. Um, we know that the coordinated framework is already under review um, at OSTP in a multi-agency process, and the possibility of, um, of the release of gene drive modified organism stretches that framework even further um, and highlights the need for review. Just wanted to underscore again the fact that this ecological risk assessment is very critical because it will allow us to consider alternative methods to reach the same endpoint or endpoints. And in the report, we appreciate the fact that uh, it will require cooperation across multiple agencies as far as the federal government is concerned. Uh, it's the nature of this sort of research that it's, it's multidisciplinary, it's integrative, it requires uh, collaboration at significant levels. And so your point is well taken. Nancy? I think he was up next. Oh, okay, go ahead, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Bob Sorensen from the Department of State. I wonder if you could just say a word or two of what kind of international context you've had, what's your awareness of the international discussion about what needs to happen with gene drives and related technologies, whether you've had conversations with other academies of science or, or other bodies that would be relevant? We had two international members on our committee, uh, Ann Kilgigi from, from Kenya and uh, 
just Joyce Tate from uh, University of, of Edinburgh, who has been uh, active in European consideration of a wide variety of, of technologies, biotechnologies. And in terms of working with other academies, we did not. I've had a number of interpersonal conversations as part of the work that I've done with, with our national academies, um, responsible science education programs, where gene drives is still something that's not recognized. And where it is, there is a, a lot of uncertainty about it, how it may differ from the more traditional, if we can call it that, genetically modified organisms. So I think there is a large need for education and, again, the public engagement about what it is that we're talking about. We had in our, our workshop in October representatives of, of three countries, one from Kenya, one from Indonesia, one from Guatemala, who actually spoke to the unmet needs that gene drive research may help fulfill for public health concerns in their countries. And one of the, the challenges will be understanding how justice in the fair allocation of benefits and burdens from gene drive research will be perceived by different people in different countries. We may see malaria in a very different way than people who experience it on a daily basis. And to understand how to weigh those experiences is going to require uh, a communication with people in, in other parts of the world who may take a little longer to understand what a gene drive is simply because the communication hasn't reached them yet. And, and that's a challenge that we also recognize. I think our committee has also seen that our work is, is part of the tradition, the emerging tradition of anticipatory governance. So thinking about regulatory and governance issues before we have the technology in front of us poised to be released. Um, so these international conversations are incredibly important, but we're just at the beginning stages of figuring out how these different fr frameworks work together, work together, overlap, what are the gaps. Um, that kind of coordination and collaboration is definitely part of the mission of anticipatory governance. So we have these conversations and make decisions before we're faced um, with a proposed technology release. And, uh, oh, go ahead, just to follow up on that one, one more point, we did recognize that we are not necessarily very good at that public engagement. There is a lot of discussion in small literature uh, and specific disciplines about public engagement. But to know how to be effective across multiple cultures and multiple levels of understanding of science is an area where more research is needed and more clear-cut determination of what best practices might be that can be modified for this kind of discussion on a very complex scientific topic. And, and we know that there are uh, groups around the world that are, that are basically looking towards this report. They want to see what, what we have to say uh, before potentially moving on in, the, in their own way or drawing from hopefully the sorts of things uh, that we offer. You'll also find in the report uh, discussions starting, starting with values, starting with governance, the way in which testing should be done in which we argue for the involvement of communities, local communities at a variety of levels. And therefore, to the extent that it's an international question, that applies to uh, low-income countries as opposed to high-income countries. We argue for the development of, of infrastructure and capacity within low-income countries as opposed to just sort of reaching into these countries or trying to reach in. So there's a good deal of discussion along all those lines that really have application not only within the United States but also globally. Nancy? Yeah, I think, I think Dr. Collins just covered this last comment from the web. I was struck by your co recommendations on governance, that these studies should be, uh, field studies should be carried out uh, where, where there's appropriate governance capabilities, and that seems at odds with the potential countries that could benefit most from this technology, so they wanted you to comment specifically on that. Well, the, to, to build on my, on my last point, uh, I, the idea is that uh, it is not just to try to inject this technology into a country that um, might not have the capacity to completely uh, deal with it, to completely understand what's going on, but rather to build the capacity in these countries, these low-income countries, in order to be able to uh, understand, uh, work with investigators as far as this research is concerned, help develop the sort of community engagement that uh, uh, Jason has referred to in order to move ahead with the technology. So. 
Uh, yes, we were, we were very sensitive to what was going on uh, internationally, and the individuals we had on the committee uh, were just exceptional in terms of drawing attention to these kinds of issues. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Steve Supan. I'm with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy in Minneapolis. <clears throat> in your work on uh, your ILSI work, um, did you uh, interview officials concerning um, how the patent regime would affect um, both scientific development and the, um, the issues regarding uh, uh, charting human values? And then if I can ask for a follow-up regarding international, uh, did you do any research into the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, working group on uh, biological resources and traditional knowledge? Because a lot of species selection is going to come from traditional knowledge, just from, not just from scientific survey. To respond to the first part of your question, um, we did note that um, you know, systems of intellectual property are part of governance mechanisms around technologies, and so certainly they'll play a role. Um, one of the interesting features of, of gene drive research is that it's aimed at, um, at, at challenges and solutions that could provide very broad public benefits um, that may not be as easily monetized um, as other technologies have in the past. And that doesn't mean that intellectual property isn't important, but it means that it may take on a different flavor or dimension with gene drive research than we've seen um, with genetically modified organisms. But further work needs to be done in terms of thinking through how intellectual property um, should be part of the governance structure of gene drive modified organisms. And if I can just add, there may be also um, some work that needs to be done on you know, what some legal, scholar, legal uh, scholars call patent pathology and strategic use of patents versus alternative um, innovation promotion systems other than the patent system. If I can call attention to Appendix B on page 179 of the report, we have the list of the, the webinars and the speakers whom we heard from uh, mostly during the fall before, um, before the end of December. One of the things that is a, a bit of a complication for the traditional patent system is that we're calling for open sharing and a database that would provide not just protocols but data and results so that information on gene drives in specific organisms is available for widespread sharing and, and research, research use. Um, this is in part because it is so complex already. We don't want people going down blind alleys that others have discovered are, are ineffective. And it's also a safety mechanism to prevent uh, doing research that's already been done in a way that may expose uh, both workers and the environment to to harm that doesn't need to occur. Lisa, do you want to say anything more about shared databases? Um, yeah, I think the, th the only thing that I would add is that um, this is really going to be a critical thing to have as we th think about this more broadly and more globally. Um, as a PI myself, I can say that um, researchers tend, can, can tend to become isolated in their own labs, and I think it's very important. The committee recognized the importance of this community working together, engaging various publics at different levels, whether it's the community in which a gene drive modified organism would be released. So from those individuals all the way through to the scientists doing the work and the, and the funders. And I think that's it's a real key um, finding and recommendation from the report. So we'll take one more question. So, yeah. If I could just comment on that. Yeah. The, and the idea of, of the open databases and um, the sharing of information, even when it comes to the, to the design of experiments, is part of the process of transparency that goes to the social implications of this sort of research. So your question certainly has, has implications in terms of the technical side, but it has implications as well as the technical side when it comes to social sciences, when it comes to uh, communities and the communities that are involved and um, implicated as far as this research is concerned. So it all becomes uh, a complicated situation in which you really want to disentangle the pieces to the degree that you can and see how to move forward from there. Yes, sir, our last question. 
Yeah, um, Yusuf Bhatt from the Office of Space and Advanced Technology at the State Department. Um, I had a question about how, what kind of timescales are you looking for for these ecological studies? Did you, you know, it's, it's okay to propose them, but are we looking at a year-long study, decade-long study? Because there could be fairly open-ended. So did you have an opportunity to address that? Well, we didn't address the length of studies in particular, leaving that to experimental design and what we count as good experimental design. Uh, but your point is a good one. Uh, the sorts of effects that are being um, uh, looked at would be ones that could be pretty short term. But on the other hand, if you're looking for changes in gene frequencies within populations, that may proceed uh, at varying rates. It could be on the order of uh, weeks, days, depending upon the generation time of the organism. But it could also be that there are longer term effects. And so to go back to a question uh, that uh, Todd asked earlier on, uh, there are um, infrastructure issues, implications in terms of funding agencies and the amount of time that might be needed in order to fund projects, in order to really see what the effect is of releasing these gene drive modified organisms. So that would be part and parcel of the experimental design process. We do call for very long term monitoring though and the funding that would make long-term monitoring possible. Thank you all. That will conclude our briefing. I'd like to remind everybody that the uh, full text of the report is available to read uh, or download uh, for free uh, on our website, nationalacademies.org. Uh, also, we'll uh, archive video of today's briefing there as soon as possible, along with the uh, Paris, uh, PowerPoint slides. So I would like to thank our committee panelists uh, very much. Have a good day. Thank you.